You know, so first off, um, uh, an example I often use uh, is that if, uh, if I come over to your house and I steal your TV and the police, you know, catch up to me and they say, well, Terry, why did you steal, you know, uh, so-and-so's TV? And I say, well, because I was afraid they were going to steal mine. That would not be an excuse for why I stole their TV. But what these anti-Muslim hate groups are trying to propose to us is that we should go ahead and take away the religious liberty of our Muslim sisters and brothers because of some fear that they're going to take away ours, a fear that they themselves are generating through their hate speech. And so that's just silly. The best way to support and strengthen the human and civil rights of everyone in this country, whether they're religious or not, or whatever tradition they follow, is to strengthen all of our rights, not to take them away. And that's just really an important uh, you know, democratic principle that I think all of us um, need to spend time and energy um, supporting and maintaining. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about Sharia and Christianity and, and Judaism a little bit. And the rabbis tell us that, of course, uh, there's this thing called halakha, which is the sort of a, a, a compilation of Jewish laws and teachings, including a lot of religious teachings as well. And, um, and the, the word halakha means the way or a path. Uh, Christianity itself was, uh, was a movement in the first century that often was referred to as the way. Uh, Jesus also encouraged uh, other people to understand that the I am, that is the creator of all, is the way, and that he was embodying that way in his life. So it's a very common term. In fact, the, the name of path to understanding is sort of a nod uh, to that use of the term uh, path or walkway or, um, with respect to religious traditions. Uh, Buddhists have the, the middle way. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of traditions out there that use that kind of language. Um, so there are some similarities, of course, tremendous similarities between uh, Christian, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in terms of, of the teachings of Sharia. And I've gone over some of those about monotheism, the idea that there's one God, to, to care for your neighbor as you care for yourself, um, and to care for the, the animals and plants and ecosystem of our world. All of those are, are common. There are some differences. Um, one of the differences, of, of course, is that, is that Christians... Uh, really set aside very early kind of some of the purity codes of Judaism um, as they began to kind of form uh, their own their own tradition. And so for some people, it feels a little bit weird to have like, you, you know, don't eat pork. Um, in fact, I had an uncle call me up and tell me that, that uh, I really should reconsider what I'm doing because Muslims were going to impose Sharia on us because uh, Costco was selling halal lamb. And so my question to him, of course, was, have you ever been to the ballpark? And they said, yeah. He said, yeah. And I said, well, uh, if, did you eat a, a kosher hot dog? And did that make you Jewish? <laughs> you know, no, the, the hot dog tasted good. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, and, and we could talk about what halal's for some other time, which is really about being kind to animals is really what it's, what it's all about. Uh, and so there's just, there's some differences. There are real differences, but there's an awful lot of similarity and far more of it. And for us to, to consider uh, in this country, you know, banning Sharia, well, really, that's a way to start banning other, other traditions as well. And I don't think we want to walk down that path um, as a nation. And like Anila said, uh, the anti-Muslim hate groups, you know, they did a lot of study. And they, what they did is they added Sharia to the word law. And, uh, you know, the law is kind of scary. It sort of tells you what to do. It's like a police officer pulling you over when you go too fast. Um, and Sharia is a, an Arabic term that people don't know, and that um, some groups, you know, claim uh, to be acting within when they do terrible things to people, just like the Lord's Resistance Army claims uh, to be following Jesus, to be following biblical uh, rules and, and ethics when they're, when they're murdering folks. And, and of course, we know that's, that's ridiculous. And it is also ridiculous when people claim uh, to, to act uh, out of Sharia when in fact they're, they're doing nothing of the sort. Uh, there was a, a, a big letter out to, to uh, the leader of ISIS at one point talking about uh, 18 ways in which the leader of ISIS misunderstood or ignored the core teachings of Islam in his work. So 
Uh, but that, of course, doesn't make the news. What makes the news is the negative stuff. So now I want to take you through uh, sort of how you handle it when you're talking with somebody who's been kind of captivated by all the negative stuff. And let me let me uh, share my screen again and take you through a, a few slides here. This is this will be the second, the, the first time we talk about our messaging approach here and how you can talk with people. And then we'll go over it again next time and share some specific messages that work. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of challenges when people get into this uh, sort of fear-based mode. And of course, the first one is fear itself. Um, fear becomes real, even if the thing we don't, that we're fearful of isn't really a threat to us, right? The feeling just kind of starts to take over. And the human heart is way too precious and beautiful to be taken over by fear, but it's there. And so we have to acknowledge that fear. Second, we have to understand that most people and most of us, including me, uh, don't always make uh, logical conclusions and then make decisions. Sometimes our, our guts kind of lead us to, to an assumption. And then over time, we find other rationale to help back up that moral intuition. So we have to understand that a lot of our decisions as people is really based on more intuitions or, or gut, gut sort of in, um, decisions than it is like logic. And that's where confirmation bias, of course, comes in. That we as human beings tend to take in information that agrees with our position, and we tend to resist information that causes uh, uh, some question or some doubt or perhaps complicates our point of view. And that's just true of human beings. It's true of me too. And then lastly, we have to understand the power of in-groups and out-groups. Um, so we all are part of a group and, and over, over the, the, the course of human development, we realize that groups are really important for our survival. And so we get very strong feelings about our in-group, like what happens at a football game between WSU and Oregon, right? For, for, for no reason, we're just shouting like crazy against the other team because we, we are perceiving to be part of that in-group. But is that group really all that important from a survival or human or, or values perspective? Well, you know, not always, right? So here's you, you're a person. How can you kind of start to help uh, to, to, to bridge this gap between, between folk that are fearful? Well, one part of it is that you're part of an in-group and you maintain your identity with and your participation in that in-group and that's a really good thing. But part of what we can do to help is to, is to start to move ourselves into a place where we're relating to an in-group and also relating to an out-group that may be feared. And as we begin to do that work of relating to that out-group, some people in our in-group will start to say, well, hey, um, maybe I could go with you and meet some of those people. And so then the people in the in-group and the out-group start to get to know each other and they realize how much they have in common and that they're all so different from each other. And that those differences actually add flavor and an incredible capacity for making better decisions because we're different, but we still share a lot of things in common. And working within your in-group and staying part of it and relating to an out-group that's being feared, both of, that, both of those are extremely important. So we want to say that when we're working to counteract you know, fear with people, we want to make sure we are trying to speak primarily to persuadable people. So when Neela and I don't spend all of our emotional or spiritual energy, you know, our, our, our time trying to, or trying to reach unreachable people or to persuade the opposition. We're trying to work with persuadable people. And we, and we also always realize that that's kind of up to them whether they wanna be persuaded or not. It's not up to us to force them into that. And so what we try to do is, is to offer three pieces, three things that really help people to, to remove fear, to have an opportunity to take fear out of the, the center of their heart. Number one is to talk about shared values. And that can also mean talking about some, some differences, but build on some shared values that we have. Number two, share a positive story with people about the group that is feared. And those positive stories, they won't work right away. They won't like change people overnight. You can't expect it to, but start telling those positive stories because again, we live in a media environment in which almost the only stories we hear about anybody are negative. 
I mean, I was talking to a Roman Catholic priest recently, and he was just lamenting how a lot of the good work Roman Catholics do around the country to deal with poverty are just not told. But other stories, of course, have predominance. So we only hear the negative about each other. And those positive stories are like water in a desert for us to be able to see each other in a more positive light. And then lastly, follow up with some information. And, and uh, some of that information just could be the way American Muslims or whatever what other group is being dehumanized are contributing to our larger society in, in beautiful and positive ways. And so the change process typically begins with relationship. And, and we know that, that information is good, but even more powerful than positive stories are people being able to get to know American Muslims. The problem is that American Muslims make up about 1% of the population. And that means that they would have to have 100 best friends. And that's pretty exhausting, which is where allies can come in. We can kind of share some of those positive stories. We can help people to understand in our, in our own in-groups that, that, um, that we respect and have gotten to know American Muslims. And we can share some of those, uh, those stories in, in, of our own relationship with them. And then lastly, I should say that we that the most powerful thing of all in a, in a kind of a change process is really work for the common good. Um, when we get together and build the, the communities, uh, respond to a need in our community, that's one of the most profound things. So I'm just going to share a couple of these to make sure that we have time for um, just kind of the basics of an approach before we have, have time for Q&A. So before you respond to somebody, um, I really want to encourage you to consider the context. Is this a private situation? Is it within your own community? Is it a public setting? Is it a media engagement? The, the more you go down that list, the more careful you got to be. Okay. So before you respond to something, consider the context and make sure that you're calm enough to respond. Number two, consider the person. Is this a genuine confusion or misinformation? Or are they kind of playing gotcha? Is it some kind of competition? Are they pretty hardened in their perspective? And then also think about who else is listening and make sure that, um, that you're responding in the, in the most positive way you know, to that person. But as you hear their question, we wanna encourage you to meet the emotion and not the myth. So acknowledge and empathize with their emotions, with what they're valuing, with what they're, what they're fearful about. But don't try to repeat the messaging. Don't like, and, and don't necessarily contradict it right away, right? Help them understand that you hear their concern. And that will be a really important and powerful way for you to begin the conversation. 